At Metropolitan Community College, we believe in and often say diversity matters. And as part of that, the college recognizes LGBTQ Pride Month by welcoming a variety of speakers to the college. And one of those individuals is Ryan Salins, author of the book Second Son. Ryan became internationally known after the release of the 2006 documentary Gender Rebel, which followed Ryan through his beginning in the beginning steps of his gender transition. I'm Kent Pavelka, your host, and coming up next, we'll introduce you to Ryan Salins on Metro and more. Greetings from the set of Metro and More at Metropolitan Community College, serving more than 50,000 students with over 120 programs at our eight locations in the daytime, evening, weekends, or online. And we are back in the studio with our guest, Ryan Salins, here to share his story and his message. Ryan, a LGBTQ speaker, an author, consultant, publisher, and it's a pleasure to have you on campus and on the show, Ryan. Well, thank you for having me. Good to have you. Um, let's begin at the beginning. You were born on August 31st, 1979 as Kimberly Ann Salins. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about uh, those first years and, and where all you've been and what life's been about for you. Okay. Uh, well, I was born in Aurora, Nebraska, which in most people may know where it's at, but it's in the center of the state, or just two hours west here of Omaha. Uh, my dad was a chiropractor in the town, and my mom was a homemaker. Uh, I was the third kid born to my family, so I have a brother who's nine years older than me and a sister who's two and a half years older than me. Um, and from a very early age, I always identified as male, uh, even though I was born assigned female. And I didn't verbally express it in, in the sense of telling mom, my mom and dad that that's how I identified, but they could see it through my behavior. Uh, I idolized Superman. By first grade, I firmly believed that I was Elvis Presley reincarnated. <laughs> 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 he died in August. I was born in August. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter. It was 1977 when he died, and I was born in 79. I was Elvis, right? Uh -huh. uh, and so I, I was very aligned with male behaviors and toys and when I wear boys clothes uh, from a young age. Uh, but growing up, people weren't talking about transgender identities. Uh, it was uh, the trans community was kind of in the underground tunnels at that time because of different things that happened in the 50s, 60s and 70s with providers that worked with trans individuals. And so I didn't understand that what I was feeling was actually something real that my body was actually male and not female. What, what did you think, you were a tomboy? I mean, how, how did it feel to you to have this kind of disconnect? Is, is disconnect a, a anywhere close to me in the right word? So, so, you know, we always use a label tomboy with me because that's what we could do to describe my behaviors and my feelings. But I remember around age seven, I was in our bathroom one day and I just realized that my body was female. Prior to that, I was still in this little magical world where I thought, oh, I'm just going to turn into a boy, you know, any yeah, day now. Yeah. Uh, but I realized it wasn't happening. And I remember just saying to myself verbatim, I don't know where I got this language from, but I said, this really sucks. <laughs> I've got dealt a bad deck of cards and I need to live with this the rest of my life. And I don't know if I can. You were how old? Seven. Seven. And I started to get extremely depressed, and I started thinking about suicide. Um, wow. That I carried with me throughout my life because I was so scared and confused as to why is this? Why am I like this? What did you do at that point? Did you did you uh, bring it up to your folks, or how long did it take you to to say anything to anybody else about it? I didn't bring it up to my mom and dad because I think I was probably embarrassed and I was scared and I was confused and I was worried that they wouldn't receive what I was feeling well at that time. That was just my own fears. Uh, so I kept it all to myself. Mm -hmm. And I think your brother, is a, you, was your brother the first person you confided with in years later? Yes, so before my transition, uh, I transitioned when I was 25. And before I did that, the first person in my family that I did confide to was my brother. Uh, two months before I began my physical transition. Yeah, he didn't get it either right away, right? Well, you know, it was funny. So I came out to him via an email uh, because it was too hard for me to verbally express. Yeah. Like I kind of get a deer in the headlights 
when sure. I get uncomfortable. And so I just emailed him one day and said, hey, Greg, how's it going? How's the weather? Because <laughs> it's always safe to start with weather, yeah. right? Uh, and then I said, well, so anyway, I'm transgender. And this is what it means. And here's some websites that other people have put up. I'm going to start, I'm going to go and have surgery. Then I'm going to start on hormones. Okay, love you, bye. <laughs> 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 and he emailed me back pretty quickly and it just said, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Uh, I've just saw a documentary on this. I thought you were transgender anyway. And so then I emailed them back jokingly and said, well, it would have been nice if you would have told me because I did not know. Uh, just as a joke, because we can't tell people. They need to find who they are on their own sure. time. But then the next day he emailed and he said, okay, I'm freaking out now because it was really sinking in. And again, when I began my transition in 2005, it was a very different landscape uh, than it is today for the trans community. I'm actually very impressed by how rapidly knowledge and conversations and policies have been changing over the past 12 years. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, okay, we went from 7 to 25. Mm -hmm. What happened between 7 and 25? Um, so for me, middle school and high school were a little rough uh, just because I continued to feel more and more uncomfortable in my body. And so I tried to constrain my body through exercise and diet because I thought that that could make me feel better in my own skin, but it didn't. And by the time I went to college, I felt even more displaced. And so I decided that I just should lose weight. And, to be more presentable and accepted. And unfortunately, by the beginning of my sophomore year, I became anorexic. Oh, wow. And so I struggled for severely for over a year and a half with anorexia nervosa uh, before seeking help with a therapist on my campus. I went to college at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I worked with the same therapist then for six years, uh, the end of my sophomore year through to uh, the day before I graduated from my second master's degree at UNL um, and it was a really hard road for me in recovery from my eating disorder but I always say that I wouldn't be here today without having gone through that because it forced me to go to therapy. Uh, do, you, do you think that uh, your identity issues caused the, the, the anorexia? Well with any eating disorder there's multiple factors it's just not one thing that can cause someone to struggle. Uh, with eating behaviors and food. Uh, but definitely my identity played a, a part and a role in that. Uh, also, we look at personality structure and how you were raised and different traumas that have happened in your life that can also impact um, what happens for folks that have eating disorders. I want to ask you to uh, share your message that you, you shared here on campus at the Fort Omaha campus, maybe the five minute version. But I, I would, I, I guess maybe, um, and I'm guessing here, the thing that most people are curious about is uh, they don't get it. I mean, how can, how can someone who is not transgender understand uh, what it's like? I mean, is, is it, is, uh, it's different than being homosexual, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so what do you do to try to understand? What, you know, well, how I do you explain that to right. people? Um, well, I think it's, it's probably near impossible to fully understand what it's like to be transgender unless you live it, right? Yeah. Like, I don't understand what it's like to not be transgender right. and what that feels like. It, I think it'd be fascinating to, you know. Do you still feel transgender now that you've made the transition? Well, yes, yeah, just because of everything that has happened in my life, right? right? I mean, it's, it's a label that I use uh, when I do education. And for me, for the past 12 years, I've been traveling a nation sharing my transition story and helping educate audiences so that we can move to a place of more inclusion. So for me, it's a label that will always be with me as long as I do this work, right? right? Uh, now, having said that, when I'm walking down the street, I'm not wearing my trans identity on my sleeve and, <laughs> and introducing myself as, hi, I'm a trans man, right? Right, right. Yeah, so, but it's an important piece of who I am. Yeah, but I interrupted you. You were saying how it's impossible for someone to... Right, so, I mean, if you try to just understand what it feels like, I don't think you're going to be able to, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I think that what we can do is just listen to people's stories and just understand that you don't have to understand all there of it, you go. right? Uh, but just recognize that there are people that are transgender. There's one very conservative estimate, very conservative because we do not have proper ways to collect data on trans identities that says that the estimate there's at least 1.4 million people, people here in the United States that identify as transgender. And I can tell you that number is actually much higher than that, but that's the estimate that we have right now. Is your message when you deliver it for 
primarily for people who are, are, have issues with their own identity, mm -hmm. or are you trying to more educate the, the general public about, or both? Both. Yeah. Right. Uh, because for people that are trans, my story is there, a message is there to help provide hope uh, and guidance in their own journey. Uh, for folks that aren't trans, it's again a place for them to learn more about transgender identities. And again, just break down the defenses that we may have when we're introduced to a topic that we don't understand. In your interaction with folks, do you feel that those barriers break down with difficulty or or is it easy to break those barriers down? For the most part, I find that the reception of my message and of talking about trans identities is a positive one for people in the audience, right? I've had some instances where people come up to me afterwards and they may be really upset. I've had some people that are shaking, uh, some people that start getting teary, and it's because it's bringing out emotions within them. Either it was something that they just don't understand that makes them more confused yeah. and it makes them scared, or they're starting to recognize something within themselves or something within one of their family members or someone close to them. Uh, so it's very emotional yeah. for many people. So share the two minute, three minute version of what you told uh, your audience here on campus. <laughs> uh, well, so today I was on campus just to read from my book, Second Son. So I read a chapter that's titled Superman versus my mom. And it talks about Superman as my idol and me trying to change my appearance so that it falls more in line with how I envision myself on the inside. And in that case, it was getting a haircut, having my haircut short so that it made me feel more comfortable in my skin. Mm -hmm. And then we opened up the rest of the time to discussion, uh, questions and conversation. So folks were allowed to ask any question that they had and we explored gender identity development. We explored coming out to family and family acceptance and the timeline that that may take uh, for families that have a hard time uh, understanding what this means for their child or sibling. Uh, and then closed on relationships, uh, more specifically for me, my, my uh, relationship with my wife uh, and her family. Yeah. Uh, wh wh is there a most common question people have of you? Um, or a couple? There, there couple are three? many questions that people ask. You know, one is like, how did you meet your wife? That's a common question people ask. Um, how did your parents and family take the news and what happened? And we know your father didn't do well with that, right? When I first came out, it was extremely difficult for my dad. And, you know, we have to keep in mind, again, I came out in 2005 when people weren't really talking about trans identities. Uh, my father is now 72, so he was raised in a more conservative uh, generation than we have for the younger generations here with families. Uh, and there was a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear of what does this mean for my kid? Uh, what does this mean for me? And maybe some embarrassment and some pride issues there of who's going to talk about this. Because not only did I transition, I was an out trans man that has had my story spread across the world. Sure. And so yeah. <laughs> it's not like a private family thing. Oh, you yeah, know? Yeah. It's like I'm very public about my journey uh, and the experiences I've had. So there's you know, many issues that impacted my dad uh, when I first began. And he's good now? Uh, I am in the best place I've ever been with, uh, in, with my father from when I was a kid to now. That's so great. How long did that take for him? And what do you think that process was about? Um, I think it's one, just again, breaking down what you don't understand and breaking down pride issues and adjusting to your child who now goes by a different name and a different pronoun and physically my body is changing through surgeries and hormones, adjusting to all that. You know, for many parents, they may question did I do something wrong? Was it something that I did that caused this, mm -hmm. right? Other parents, again, are just really fearful of, is my child making the right decisions and is something bad gonna happen to them in the future? And so I think it's for my family it's been time, time to heal and time to be able to have more conversations. Uh, I also think that technology has played a role in where my dad and I are today because I think we've had a lot of miscommunication over the years. I've learned as I've aged that there's a lot of me that's exactly like my dad. <laughs> uh, one of that being that I don't like talking on the phone. I just really don't like it. I have troubles hearing. and That's a generational thing, too. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You call right. somebody, my son, and they, don't, they just don't answer. Them. Right. It's text or nothing. Right, yes. But, yeah. but my dad also doesn't like talking on the phone. And so then he never talked to me when I called over the years. I thought it was because he wasn't approving of me. But I just think it's just he doesn't like gotcha. phones like gotcha. me. And so a year and a half ago, my dad got an iPhone. 
And that's what's really changed our relationship because I text him one day and he texts me back and now we text cool. a lot. Very cool. Uh, and it's, now I go and see them frequently uh, when they, they're in town. And so it's nice to finally have this new relationship with my family. Can you begin to describe the, I don't know, I'm gonna choose a word, the, the, just the probably near agony of, of going through all this to get to where you are today? That would be a long conversation. Yeah, that'd be, that's like a, a question with your therapist, right? That's right. Uh, you know, I always say, I don't know why I'm transgender, right? But I am. And I'm so thankful that I was able to accept that and take the steps to move forward in my transition, no matter how scary they were, no matter how many barriers were put up in front, front of me, because there were many, either financially or with different providers that assisted me in my transition. And uh, I'm just thankful that I was able to push past the scariness uh, to continue to move forward to who I am. Did that get to the point, maybe agony is too strong of a word, did that right. get to the point where you could, when you were maybe indecisive about going forward with this, really didn't want to go forward with life, maybe? Well, I can say I was never indecisive about going forward with my transition. Um, when I found this book in December 2004 in Boston, in an LGBT bookstore about transgender men, it was a photography book. When I saw their images, I knew instantly that's who I was, and five months later I began my transition. There was no looking back, I knew who I was. So I never had a question around that. Uh, but I can say that I struggle with suicide ideation as a young child. I've had two suicide attempts in my life. And I still have suicide ideation that pops up, uh, especially around the end of each month. Oh. I don't, th is there, there's an energy thing that happens then where it, it creeps into my mind. And so that's something that I just have awareness of. Uh, I would never take action on it, but I think right. depression is still something that's prominent in my life. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's common enough for people to have suicide ideation um, without the extra burden of what you had to carry. Right. right. I mean, right. I think it's more common amongst everybody than everybody wants to admit. Um, what, uh, you want to talk about the transition? Tell what it was like or explain it? Um, so, it's amazing. <laughs> That's what the one way I can describe a transition process. Uh, I mean, I was very fortunate because I was able to access providers to assist me, and I was able to access financial resources uh, due to having very good credit uh, to get loans to help pay for the care that I needed, right? For many people, they may have difficulty finding providers first to assist them, and they may not have the financial resources to move forward. So I'm very lucky and fortunate that everything kind of fell in place for me over the years. So you found the right people where, and what, it, what did it cost you? Uh, so I had a provider for hormones in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I lived at the time. I had a provider here in Omaha that completed my chest surgery another provider in Lincoln that completed my hysterectomy, and then I flew to Belgrade, Serbia for um, a lower surgery completion. And I chose Serbia just because financially I could access that yeah. through loans, but I couldn't access it here in the wow. States due to insurance. Um, so I've spent around $40,000 in my physical transition. Best um, 40000 you ever that's spent, That's true, right? that's true. <laughs> and it, you know, again, it was a very difficult process, and I did it all on my own. Um, How long did it take? I completed everything that I needed physically uh, for in three years. three years. So I began in 2005 and ended in 2008. But again, I was able to find the resources for it. And I knew for me personally, those aspects of a physical transition were extremely important. For other folks, they may not want surgery um, or they want to take more time to explore if it's something that they really need in their life or not. Uh, and you know, sometimes we get really focused on the surgeries and we don't actually see the individual or the human being that's, right. no matter what your body parts are, that doesn't matter. It matters of who you are on the inside and being able to live your authentic life. Sure. Yeah. 2005, you began, 2008, you got it done, the physical mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. um, obviously that was important to you. Mm -hmm. how, how much different and how differently did you feel in 2005 and then in 2008 when this was done? Um, you know, with each step I took, I just felt more comfortable in my skin and safer navigating this world outside of my home. Uh, it, was a, one, it was a safety issue for me uh, and a comfort issue. 
safety issue in that your appearance challenged people as a female? Uh, safety issue is in, I felt that with each physical step I took in my transition, people would not harass me yeah. <laughs> or attack me um, if just in a public space. Yeah. You know, I'm, obviously I still have to have safety concerns as a public speaker uh, who travels a nation talking about LGBT identities wow. because there may be people that are hateful. Um, but I try to push that out of my head and focus on who's in the room and getting a message across to open up hearts. The book, we talked about the book, uh, Second Son, My Destiny, Love and Life. Um, give us a little synopsis of what it is and where it goes. Right. What, what, what do you say in it? So I wrote Second Son because one of my masters is, is in English and creative writing. So I thought I should probably put this to use uh, for doing it. And I, I thought that since I've spent so much of my life speaking and sharing my story, I, it would be great to have it in writing for folks. Yeah. And so it takes readers through my life. Uh, and it, it begins with my family and my parents and uh, my childhood and then moves into my teenage years. Uh, I have it separated into three sections. So part one is focused on my childhood up to high school. Part two, I, I diverge into just identity issues in general around uh, being trans and different things that I've done in my life around that, like feelings around scars, having scars from surgery, uh, having tattoos that, to represent something in your life, uh, choosing your name, right? Yeah. And then part three moves into my life more post-transition as far as relationships with friends and with my partners. Very cool. I, yeah. I think it would be fascinating for anybody to read. Well, everybody says that they love it. I mean, I, I cannot be believe from around the world people that contact me that have found it to be so helpful. Um, can you take a minute to go into those three sections and is there any way to give a real bottom line uh, delivery to what it is you say in each one of the sections? Right. Well, so with part one being childhood uh, through high school, that would be really focused on identity development and trying to understand who you are and navigating not having acceptance from the people around you. Yes. Part two is around unique things uh, that trans individuals like myself may go through. Such right? as? Uh, such as, again, being able to pick your name. I was uh, going to ask you, how did you get Ryan from Kim become Ryan from Kimberly, uh, but I keep interrupting yeah, that's too. Fine. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Well, I'll answer it really quick, then we can go back. So like for picking name, right? Yeah. Some people may ask their family, what name would you have yeah. given me if I would have been born a boy or a girl? Mm -hmm. And they use that. Other people may have a hero or someone that they idolize and they want to have that name too for their own personal strength. Then you should have been Clark for Clark Kent. <laughs> Superman. Yeah, I think I probably would have gone with Kent instead of Clark. <laughs> but, but Kent. So, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Or Kyle. You could have like done that. Um, and then for me, I was actually laying in bed one night with my ex-girlfriend and we were just tossing out names. And she, hit, she said the name Ryan. And I was like, I like that name yeah. and I'm part Irish. So I was like, I'm going to use that. Very and good. I just, I love it. It's, it's my ask. name. But anyway, we're in section two here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, choosing your name, yeah. dealing with body image issues, um, dealing with scars, uh, navigating insurance and the discrimination there. So just unique things that impact trans What, what do you do for that? I mean, what's the issue there? Well, it depends. So many insurance companies do not cover transitional day care. And the reason for that is they list it as being exploratory, experimental, or cosmetic. And the reason why they do that is back in 1979, uh, two psychologists did a terrible study on transgender women that was not ethical and it asked ridiculous questions. And at the end of their study, they felt that it was cosmetic and not medically needed. And that's when the insurance companies were putting it in as an exclusion or inclusion. Sure. And we're still fighting that today, right? So there's struggles with insurance as far as, are they gonna cover the care I need for my transition? And are they gonna cover the care that I don't need for my transition, just my general health? Yeah. Because sometimes they may say, oh, you're on hormones, I'm on testosterone. That can be seen as a pre-existing condition, right? So there's fears around that. Uh, or for me personally, uh, when I had my hysterectomy, the insurance company pre-approved it and paid for it, but then four months later they did a post-payment audit and said that my gender marker on my um, insurance card didn't match the surgery, right? Because my insurance card was male, the surgery was hysterectomy. So they got the money back from the hospital and I had to file an appeal and use a lawyer to do it to wow. be able to get that moving forward. 
But every other thing then after that with that particular insurance company, everything I did, they always audited it. I went in for sinus infection. I got a letter saying that they were reviewing that claim. And wow. so it was really distressful. Yeah. So then part three moves into the journey of relationships and navigating those relationships. Not Re just uh, your, your uh, marital or your spousal relationships, right, but, but relationships family in general. Family and friends. Friendly friends. And myself too. Sure. So I, that's how I've broken it up in the book. So what do you tell folks? folks what's, the, what's the key to that part? Uh, the key to navigating relationships is having patience. There you go. Right, you need patience. You need to allow people the time and space to process information and explore their own feelings around it. When people don't, how do you feel? When they don't have... When they haven't gotten to that place yet where they accept it with you. Well, for me at this point, I feel pretty solidified with, with the people in my life that matter, right? As far as acceptance. But when they didn't, like for example, when I struggled with my mom and dad, um, I recited what my therapist kept reciting with me when I was struggling with my eating disorder. Um, they, whatever they say that's negative or where they say it's not accepting, it's not about me, it's about them. Yeah. And their own process and their own confusion and fear. Right. So I need to just continue to move forward with who I am and allow them to process what they have to and hope that they can eventually get to a place of acceptance. And they have, but it takes time. That's cool. I mean, anybody could use that advice, right? Right. I, in, in issues. Right. Which is, which is great when I go out and speak because sure. a lot of the stuff that I've navigated, this could apply to any person, regardless of your transgender or not. It's about communication and different relationship dynamics. I hadn't even thought about asking you about Bruce Jenner, but I, I, I will. Uh, what, how much of an impact did that have on um, the way things were and are now? And do you watch Orange is the New Black? I was thinking of the character, um, the, tr the transgender uh, male to female uh -huh. in that, in that mm -hmm. uh, TV series. Well, for Caitlyn Jenner, uh, you know, there are people in the trans community that are not happy with her or what the coverage that she's received, right? Because? Um, f we can look at from like a social justice issue of someone who is Caucasian, transitioning from male to female that has a lot of money uh, getting the coverage, while we have all these disenfranchised groups. And tr like, for example, when we look at for transgender women of color, uh, the impact of racism and discrimination and transphobia um, creates not only economic disparities for trans women, but also disparities with their health. Uh, there was one statistic that said for transgender women in the South, transgender women co of color in the South, their average life expectancy is age 35 mm -hmm. because of the hate crimes and violence that happen against them. So we can look at it from there. There's other people that take issue with her political alignings and her commentary. Uh, around Democrats uh, that they find oh, to be. Oh, we're getting into, into, into right, politics. Right, even, for, right? for folks that they could take issue with that. Um, and also issues around visibility. So we have another trans woman uh, who is against Caucasian that gets the visibility while other, other people are held in the shadows again. So there's many issues that people may have. My one thing is every story out there can make a difference. And with Caitlin's story, she was able to get into the TV rooms of people that say are 70 or 80 or 90 years old uh, that knew her before sure. grew up with her. And they may take an interest to the issue that they wouldn't if it was someone else, yeah. right? So every story does make a difference. And it's been wonderful with Orange is the New Black and what that has done for Laverne Cox's career as a transgender woman of color uh, who, who is a wonderful actress. And so, you know, Orange is the New Black has really hit on many different social justice yeah, issues. Yeah. And, so, and so it's great to have that there so we can have conversations uh, and start raising more awareness. Uh, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where Laverne goes uh, within her other uh, acting um, career. Yeah, thanks for helping me with the name there. Did, did, was there any, anything in, in, in your life as you went through all this um, that said to you at any given time, it's gonna be easier to live the lie than, to, than not to live the lie? No. Um, when I came out to my parents, I did it through a letter. And at one point I said, again, I do not know why I'm trans, but I am. And at this point in life, you can either have a happy kid or a dead kid. 
um, there was no way I could continue moving forward. When I finally understood who I was, there was no way I could move forward unless it was going more towards who I was instead of staying back. I couldn't do it. You think that's pretty much the case with everybody? I think uh, it happens, again, everybody's story is different. Right, right. You know, I always say I'm not the spokesperson for the trans community. I can simply just share my story and perspective and journey. But when we look at statistics, um, the National Center for Transgender Equality just released their second survey, National Climate Survey of the trans community. And they just released the data in 2016. They had almost 28,000 respondents to this survey, right? And 41% of the 28,000 reported that they had at least attempted suicide once in their life. And so this is very prominent in the trans community uh, because again, especially when we look at trans youth, if they're in families that aren't accepting or if they keep running into barriers within their school uh, or barriers with providers, Many are like, what's the point of moving forward? I have no hope. But you did too, didn't you? I did, but I didn't know I was trans back when I was growing up because no one was talking about it, right? Did and you so think you were homosexual maybe? Um, okay. So, n not really. I mean, when I was young, I, I did recognize I had attraction towards females, but I also had attraction towards men. And so, I was focused more uh, on my attraction towards men as I was growing up. And that may have just been part survival mode, growing up in a small town where, where people didn't really talk about LGBT issues at that time. Um, so for me, you know, the awareness again of being male, it got, I was aware of it when I was a child, but when I moved into middle school and my puberty began, as my body started to change more and more into a female shape and form, the awareness of being male got completely shoved down because I thought that that was never possible. There must be something going on with me, and I tried to write it off at that time. I don't know what I would have been like. Maybe the beginnings of the anorexia, even though it didn't right. manifest right then. Yes, yes. I did have disordered eating through high school, uh, and obs I, I had obsess obsessive compulsive behaviors around exercise. Uh, during that time. So that's the way I was, those were my outlets to try to escape from the feelings that I had. You could, thought you could change your body by mm -hmm. exercise. Did you hate your body? Yes. Right. Yes, I did. My, the shape and form. You know, sometimes people talk about being transgender and being born into the wrong body. I always say I didn't, I wasn't necessarily born into the wrong body. I was born into the wrong gender, but uh, yeah. I still have the same body and this body is, was, has been with me since the beginning. So. Yeah. But well, then the testosterone is something you got to keep doing. Yes, so with and hormone therapy, they hormone recommend once you begin, you continue, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, I will be on hormone therapy the rest of my life, right? And, and that, what, help, helps the, the physicality, uh, preserves it as it is, or builds it, or what? Well, all bodies need hormones. Uh, and so, like for me, I've had a hysterectomy and oophorectomy, and oophorectomy is a removal of the ovaries, and so there would be no estrogen really in my body, or small you'd amounts, be at, but without hormones. Yes, yeah, so I'd be without hormones if I wasn't on testosterone, right? Uh, and and that, what, what does that? Ha what what, is, what happens when that happens? Do you know? If, if I were not, if, if you don't, if you don't have any hormones either way, um, you your health would decline rapidly. Your energy your muscle tone, your bone density, uh, your mood. Bodies need hormones. We all need hormones. Uh, kind of maybe some of the effects that women have after menopause. So the, yeah, it'd be similar. Yeah. Or, you know, even for men, testosterone levels decline as you age. No, so no, <laughs> It no. does happen, which is why you could see someone that was like, you know, in their 20s and being six foot five and then they're yeah. 80 some and they're like, uh, five foot seven, because okay, you shrink. It's osteoporosis, you, you lose your bone density, you lose your muscle right. mass. Uh, so that's why now we're seeing all these advertisements for doing hormone therapy, sure. replacement therapy for people as they age to try to help keep your metabolism going and uh, assist with your just feeling, overall feelings. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the, uh, what, what's next for you? I mean, you're a young man, how old are you now? I'll be 38, 38 next month, yeah. Young as yeah. far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, Mice agree. This, 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 uh, pardon me? Mice agree, but that's okay. <laughs> the, uh, the journey you're on, and you have been on since your, since your uh, transition, mm -hmm. uh, you envision yourself continuing to go out and educate and speak and yes, it's help a, people in that sense? It's my uh, life's purpose uh, is a speaker. And so I hope to just continue to build 
what's well, already becoming very, it's growing rapidly, but I hope to continue to build my speaking career. And, and I work within all scopes. I work with corporations. I work with healthcare agencies. I work with residential treatment centers. I work with schools, I work with universities and colleges. Uh, so I can work within any of those scopes, either around transgender identities or LGBT identities. And I also do work with eating disorders and body image. So I plan to continue um, doing this work until, well, actually, I don't need to retire. So it's something I can continue to do until, I guess, I pass away. Yeah, you, you want to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how, how different are the issues, LGBT issues, from transgender issues? Because you say you can speak to either. Right. So when we talk about LGB, that stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and we can often, often expand the uh, acronym. More commonly, we see the acronym as LGBTQ, yep. and the Q can stand for queer or questioning. And that's a word that some people cringe at. Pejorative. Yes. Uh, but in the 1990s, activists started to reclaim the word. They wanted to take the power Kinda away like from people. Kind of like the N-word. Uh, they're different. They're in, definitely in, different. In a but way, <laughs> in a way, so yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So they're uh, the different things. And but with looking at the word queer, it allows us to be freed from labels, right? And it's it's becoming in some uh, spheres the umbrella term for the LGBTQ community uh, instead of using the word gay as the umbrella term. Because when we use the word gay, that does have a specific definition towards men who are emotionally, erotically, and affectionately attracted to other men, and then you still have men on top and in charge, right? So using the Q allows us to get away from males being on top and allows it to be more expansive, right? Includes females, that Yes, way. yes. Yeah. And it can include sexual orientation, but it can also include your gender identity and your gender expression. So it's a much more inclusive word uh, but, you know, when I educate around using the word queer, I always say we have to listen to tone and context, right? If I'm walking down yeah. the street and someone yells out, hey, queer, out their window, I know they're using it in a derogatory way, right. an offensive way. But if it's a person's individual identity, there's a lot of power behind it for them. It's a very affirming term. Do you tailor your uh, presentations to your audience, or what is it that you're primarily trying to impart to, well, let's say every audience you speak right. to? Every presentation I do is tailored to the audience, right? If I'm working with a corporation, I'm going to be looking at transgender employees. I'm going to look at your hiring processes, your retention processes, and how you respect uh, your coworkers who are trans, right? Uh, I'll always bring my story into it as well because mm -hmm. it's powerful for folks, and it, um, it's becoming widely um, requested with corporations, just storytelling around this. If I go into a healthcare agency, I'm going to be looking at from the patient-centered focus. If I'm at a college or university, I'm looking at from the college student perspective focus. So I always bring this into the, the environment that I'm, that I'm in to help educate. Couple, couple of things. Uh, one, uh, it, is it fair to say, well, you know, the general public may not know uh, how prolific being a transsexual is because how would you know? Mm -hmm. Unless you ask, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and unless you're telling me, you know, how would I know? And secondly, there, there's a lot of people who I think who think, well, what's the point of all this focus and concern? The percentages of people in the population that, that, that are transgender is so small. Why are we spending all of our time c focusing on such a small percentage-wise population? Uh, well, is that, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I understand what you're saying. Some people could try to use that as an argument, but I say every human being deserves dignity sure. and respect in life. And again, why we may have this conservative estimate, it does, a number is a number. That, doesn't, that shouldn't matter. What should matter is that we respect individuals and recognize that all of our identities are different and we all walk different paths. Uh, and if we look at the number for who is trans versus who is not trans in our society, and seeing that that is smaller, but then we look at the, the suicide statistics and attempts, this should be reason enough to recognize yeah. that people are in pain and hurting because they're not being respected or they're being pushed aside or being told that they don't understand really who they are. They should just fit in this box or that box. And that's not the right approach to take. We all have different paths. Well, so what's your message to people who are intolerant? I mean, how would you like to, how do you reach out to right. them to explain what, what's wrong about that and, and for other people, what they can do to, to be more tolerant? Right. Well, it's depending on what audience I'm working with, I may open up by saying, as I speak about these topics, some of you in the room may feel uncomfortable. And I say, that's okay. 
I want you to just be able to remain open and when we're done today, explore what it is that makes you uncomfortable mm -hmm. and ask questions. Because for any one of us, when we're introduced to a topic we don't understand or hasn't been part of our life, we're gonna become uncomfortable because it's something we're not used to, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't understand LGBT issues growing up in a conservative small town. I was uncomfortable with LGBT issues until I was able to finally open up. And not only was I able to open up to other people, but that allowed me to also open up to myself to understand more of who I was. Uh, for all of us, we ha just have to go through these steps of recognizing that our worldview is not the world. There are many different experiences out there, and it's an amazing experience for you personally when you're able to open up and learn, listen to other stories, because it helps you learn more about who you are sure. as an individual. But it's always fascinating to wonder why it is some people are obstinate in their refusal to open up, you know? People get scared, and what they don't know scares them even more. And there's other people that it can be a power issue yeah. and a control issue uh, and wanting everybody to be like them or have their views because that's the way they know it and that's the way it should be. Now we're back to politics. Well, that could be <laughs> anything. You yeah, know, it could know. be with spirituality or religion. It could be with politics. It could be yeah, with I, what I food know. you eat. So, yeah, it could sure. be with any of those topics. But I mean, as far as people being steadfast about their position right. being correct. Right. Anything else you want to share? To, with our viewers before we sign off? Um, well, first I want to thank you yeah, for having sure. the show and having this such an engaging great. conversation. And we could, we could have a series of shows. I'm I mean, sure, I'm yeah. Trying to, <laughs> trying to bring all, I, I'm sure there's some things I haven't asked you about that maybe you want to share. Well, I think, again, I always say, um, when we're going through life and we are introduce to something that scares us, but that we understand, we know is part of us, but we're fearful of what other people are gonna say or what they're gonna think. Recognize that as we go through life, the only person we had to live with for the rest of our life, life is ourselves, right? Yep. Other people in our lives come and go because we cannot control that. But up until the end and whatever happens after that, we are with ourselves. So we need to be able to honor our own truths and live as a, a authentic life as possible uh, for who we are. Yeah, that's great. And that doesn't matter what your, your gender is. It does That applies to everybody. All these issues really apply to all of us. It really does. It's all just being open to yourself then also open to other people. Ryan, thanks. Thank you so Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Great yeah. to meet you. Great to meet you too. Great to have you on campus. And thank you for being with us on Metro and more. Our goal is to better acquaint you with the mission, the leadership, and the reach of the college. I'm Kent Pavelka for Metropolitan Community College. If you have comments or questions about the program, please email us at metrovision at mccneb.edu. Thanks for watching. This has been a Metrovision production produced by Metropolitan Community College.